Uh, Mr. Chair, I yield myself such time as I may consume. Uh, the gentleman is recognized. Mr. Chair, I rise today in support of H.R. 4365, the Fiscal Year 2024 Defense Appropriation Bill, which is the result of months of hearings, briefings, and engagements of all members and subcommittee. Provide for our strong national defense. This bill recommends $826.45 billion for the Department of Defense and the intelligence community, which is $27.8 billion above fiscal year 2023 enacted level. When I became chairman of the subcommittee, I made it clear to the department they would not receive any blank checks. Any request that lacked adequate justification was early to when the funds were needed, had unjustified cost growth, or did not directly support DOD's mission, would not be funded in the bill. It is const it's our constitutional obligation of Congress, and this committee in particular, to ensure that the proper and appropriate use of taxpayer funds at a time when the Department of Defense leadership is more focused on cultural issues and war fighting mission, this obligation is more critical than ever. I'm proud to say that due to the hard work of the members of the subcommittee, the bill funds our defense needs in a fiscally responsible manner. Specifically, this bill cuts nearly $20 billion from the President's misguided request and reinvests these funds into war fighting capabilities and additional support for our service members. I also approached crafting this bill with a comprehensive strategy focused on specific lines of effort. Investing in America's military superiority to deter the People's uh, Republic, uh, Republic of China. Combating illicit fentanyl and synthetic, synthetic opioids, which are killing over 100,000 Americans every year. Shaping a more efficient and effective workforce. Creating a culture of innovation. Enhancing oversight of all programs to ensure the appropriate use of taxpayer dollars. And taking care of service members and their families. To counter China, this bill doubles funding for the internal international security cooperation programs for Taiwan, provides an additional $200 million to accelerate the delivery of the E-7, prohibits the decommissioning of four ships to grow the fleet, adds aircraft like the F-35 and the CH-53K, continues investments in next generation platforms, supports recapitalization of the nuclear triad to enhance DOD's efforts to counter the flow of deadly drugs into the country. The bill includes a historic investment of $1.1 billion in drug interdiction and counter-drug activities account, including increased funding for the counter-narcotic support, demand reduction, the, the National Counter Drug Program, and the National Guard Counter Drug Schools. The bill also moves Mexico into SOUTHCOM, area of responsibility, which will foster a more holistic approach to Latin American security issues. To drive reforms to the department workforce, this bill cuts over $1 billion from the budget request of the department's civilian workforce. This bill accomplishes this goal through attrition while exempting employees engaged in shipyard, depot, health care, and sexual assault and response duties. I want to be clear. No one will be fired as a result of this language. During our analysis of the budget request, the services and agencies across DOD reported attrition rates as high as 14%. This bill directs DOD to adopt smart business practices to become more effective and efficient, which is desperately needed. The bill also mandates a reassessment of DOD's manpower requirements, a plan to adopt technology to improve its business processes, and provides $751 million for the Chief Data and Artificial Intelligence Office to further accelerate business modernization. This multi-pronged approach is critical to create a physically sustainable and efficient workforce and is informed by previous defense reform efforts. Next, we are aware the department must innovate faster to keep pace with global threats. To do this, the bill includes over $1 billion to the Defense Innovation Unit to get needed capability into the hands of the warfighter. The bill focuses on near-term delivery of capability, partnering with the private sector, we cannot continue to take decades to produce new systems or even worse, invest billions into programs that must be eventually canceled due to non-performance. The bridge, the valley of death, the bill includes $300 million to expand the successful procurement pilot program, AppFit. Further, it creates a new portfolio to rapidly field commercial technologies through the uh, warfighter through traditional or non-traditional entities within the department. To get the department focused on its warfighting mission 
and away from culture wars, the bill includes a number of new general provisions that send a clear message to the department. These include funding prohibitions on teaching critical race theory, facilitating access to abortions that attempt to ignore the longstanding Hyde Amendment, overreach by the Biden administration on climate change, and promoting so-called diversity, equity, and inclusion programs. The fact that the committee has to address these issues reflects the failure of the department's leadership. Finally, investments in weapons systems do not matter. We fail to invest in our most important resource, our service members. With changes in this bill, junior enlisted service members will receive an average pay increase of 30%. This will have a significant impact on recruitment, retention, and will improve the quality of life for our service members and their families. I was shocked to see that the Biden administration opposed the pay increase in their statement of administrative policy. As an appropriator, uh, it is our responsibility to ensure our military has the resources necessary to defer conflict if we do get into a fight, and, if, and, if, and we win and they lose. This bill makes it clear that any adversary that challenges the United States military is not in their best interest. Before I close, I'd like to comment on the number of amendments we've received from this bill. I'm supportive of this open, transparent, and inclusive process. However, we have to be mindful not to rob our readiness accounts to fund other priorities. I look forward to working with all members on this as we move forward uh, in the process. Finally, I would like to thank all the staff for the incredible work they do to vet this budget request, work with the members, put forward recommendations, assemble the final product. As my ranking member and former chair, Ms. McCollum, knows putting together this bill is not an easy task. So I want to thank her and her staff for their cooperation. This is, not, this is a strong bill for our service members and their families. I look forward to work with my friends on the other side of the aisle, the Senate, and the administration to enact the bill as soon as possible. Not doing so is a disservice to the men and women of the United States Armed Forces. I strongly urge support of this bill, and I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman from California reserves the gentlewoman from Minnesota is recognized. I thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlewoman is recognized. I rise today in opposition to H.R. 4365, the Fiscal Year 2024 Defense Appropriation Act. As chair of the subcommittee last Congress, I understand fully the difficult process required to put this bill together. And that's why I want to thank minority staff here with me today, Jennifer Chatran, Jason Gray, Farouk Ozuk, excuse me, Farouk, Farouk Ofaso, Ben Peterson, and Mike Clark in my personal office, and Johnny Kimberly, and the fabulous minority staff that gets to work with the great majority staff who work so hard for all of us. I wish the bill before us was more focused as our job as appropriators on training and equipping our troops and ensuring that our service members and their families have their needs met at home. And that's why it's disappointing to see the majority use the appropriations process and the defense bill to push an extreme social policy agenda. The writers included in this bill, they divide. They do not unite. And here are just a few examples. The bill prohibits the Department of Defense's policy to ensure that service members and their families have access to leave and travel allowances for basic reproductive health care. The department's policy is legal under federal law. The Department of Justice has concluded that fact, and I quote from them, the DOD may lawfully expend funds to pay for service members and their dependents to travel to obtain abortions that the DOD cannot itself perform due to statutory requirements. And why is that important that the DOD itself cannot perform due to statutory requirements? Well, first I want to be clear. I do not support the Hyde Amendment, but let me address it and what this prohibition does even to services legal under the Hyde Amendment. It prohibits the DOD from using funds or facilities to perform an abortion, except in the cases of rape, incest, or when the life of the mother is in danger. That's not in keeping in spirit with the Hyde Amendment. So what does that mean to the nearly 20% of our force that's women? They do not get to choose where they serve. 80,000 of those women are stationed in states that restrict reproductive health care. If you serve in those states, 
and you are pregnant because of rape, or you're on a base that does not offer obstetrics and gynecology services, then you must travel. You must travel out of state for health care that you're entitled to. This bill interprets the Hyde Amendment in a way that it was never intended. Many service women and dependents will lose access to the exceptions of the Hyde Amendment if they're not allowed to travel to seek the health care that they need. This language, in fact, um, is a de facto national abortion ban. And I believe using our service members to do that is shameful. Young women will refuse to serve. Women will exit the force because of this. Husbands and fathers will not want to serve in states where their families will be negatively impacted. And that's why I offered an amendment and rules to strike this provision. But the majority chose not to make it in order. I wish they had. I wish we would have all had the courage to bring this to the floor and allow a debate that our service members deserve. The majority has also cut programs for diversity, equity, and inclusion, which will discourage recruitment from all across America. The private sector are embracing programs like this to keep a happy, healthy, forceful workforce. And there's language in here that bans critical race theory, but it goes far beyond that, Mr. Chair. In fact, the bill seeks to define what can and cannot be taught in our military academies on whether or not certain topics cause discomfort. This language reads like a ban on teaching American history. Sometimes facts are uncomfortable. As a former social studies teacher, I want you to know, Mr. Chair, I find this outrageous. How can our military academies tell the history of the Civil War without teaching about slavery? That's uncomfortable. How can they discuss the story and the history of desegregation in the military without talking about the Jim Crow laws that, that our black service members had to struggle with when they returned home from war? That's uncomfortable. We should be celebrating that the DOD is about to, lead to, to be led by two distinguished black Americans for the first time in history. Secretary of Defense Aust Lloyd Austin and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, General C.Q. Brown, who's incoming to this position. Their service shows us how building a diverse workforce can take us into a proud future. There are provisions in this bill that are offensive to gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender Americans, and that will impact who serves. The ban on gender-affirming care will drive transgender service members out of the military. And why, Mr. Chair, do we have an IRS provision on the tax treatment of individuals who hold a belief that marriage is a union between one man and one woman? In this bill, it's not germane. Words matter. Divisive writers will hurt the military's undermined readiness and make our national security weaker. They must come out of this legislation if we are to gain bipartisan support for this to become law. Now, turning to the numbers. The majority has funded this bill at $826.4 billion, very close to the President's budget. But I'm concerned about cuts in two areas. First, the majority has made a $714 million cut to military climate programs that and banned the assessment of military impacts on the Department. We know that climate change is a national security threat, and it drives conflict. You can ask our Indo-Pacific commander. He will tell you that climate change impacts how the United States force operates. Our military installations also face threat from climate change. Right here at home, look at the $10 billion in damage from severe weather events on installations. And this is Tyndall Air Force Base, Offutt Air Force Base in, ne in Nebraska, and Camp Lejeune in North Carolina. This spring alone, a typhoon seriously damaged Anderson Air Force Base in Guam to the tune of $4 billion, and that's just for the Air Force costs. When we cut climate programs, we pay for it on the back end. I also oppose the $1.1 billion cuts to civilian personnel in this bill. Ten years ago, Congress directed DOD to cut civilian personnel by $10 billion over five years. We achieved no substantial savings. We shifted the workforce from civilian employees to expensive contractors. Mr. Chair, I have a long history of bipartisan cooperation, and I'm proud of that. And I'm confident that Chair Calvert and I can find a way to get to agreement on a conference committee so that we can move the defense uh, spending levels forward. But I have to say again, 
how disappointed I am that the majority has included these extreme social policy writers. They will undermine the force of today, they will discourage building the force of tomorrow, and they will leave us weaker as a nation. So I urge my colleagues to oppose this bill at this time, and I reserve the balance of my time, Mr. Chair. The gentlewoman uh, reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Let, just let comment. Let's be clear about what critical race theory is. It's a decisive, decisive divisive, left-wing intellectual construct that advances the notion that racism is systematic in our country's institution. It advocates for race-based solutions and rejects equal opportunity in favor of equal outcomes. My friends on the other side like to deride the prohibition in our bill for funding activities that promote, in part, condoning an individual feelings, discomfort, guilt, or anguish. They claim that the bill will prohibit teaching uncomfortable historical truths, but they always omit the last part of that statement, which is, on account of that individual's race or sex. Do my friends on the other side really want to fund activities that debase individuals because of their race or sex? I don't think so. I reject it and this bill rejects it. I reserve the balance of my time. The gentleman reserves. The gentlewoman from Minnesota is recognized. Mr. Chair, I yield uh, two minutes to the gentlewoman from Florida, the ranking member of the Military Construction and Veterans Subcommittee, Ms. Wasserman Schultz, who is so important to the defense of our nation. The gentlewoman is recognized. I thank the gentlewoman for yielding. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. and. Uh, I rise to oppose this bill because it is incomprehensible to me that the majority would actually spend as much time, really any time, on culture war riders and focusing on their extremist priorities as opposed to protecting the national security interests of our nation. Here we are once again, considering a bill that has no chance of becoming law, as we hurtle recklessly toward a costly government shutdown that will be damaging, most importantly, to the morale of our troops, which this bill purports to actually want to protect, and to the defense of our nation. Worse, this historically bipartisan national security bill has been hijacked by radical right-wing extremists. Instead of confronting grave national security threats like climate change, this bill is riddled with bigoted attacks on Americans who bravely serve our nation. It needlessly politicizes the military and undermines the freedoms of those who risk their lives to protect ours. My colleagues across the aisle were tasked with crafting a defense bill that supports all of our service members, not just those who are white, straight, and conservative. And they failed miserably on that mission. I won't stand idly by as culture warriors try to undermine the service of LGBTQ plus individuals who bravely fought and continue to fight for our country every day. To top it off, listen to this. The report that goes along with this bill puts the word extremism in quotes. Republicans can't even admit that this is a real concept or threat. I plead with my Republican colleagues to put forward a defense bill that focuses on the real needs of the members of our military, focuses on the actual national security interests of our country, and stops feeding the extremism that is actually emanating from their own party. And I beg them to stop using this critical bill, one that we literally count on to keep every American family safe, as a disruptive wedge for partisan discriminatory time policies. Is, time is keep America strong, don't divide it. Thank you. I yield back the balance of my time. The gentlewoman reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. I yield to the gentlewoman from Oklahoma, a member of the Appropriations Committee, Mrs. Bice. One minute. The gentlewoman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise in strong support of this year's Defense Appropriations Act, and I thank Chairwoman Granger and Chairman Calvert for their hard work in crafting this important bill. Today, our nation faces serious threats from our adversaries, and in particular, the People's Republic of China. This legislation focuses on delivering the result resources needed to counter these threats and to support our service members and their families. The bill includes one of the largest pay increases for our troops in years, particularly for our junior enlisted, as well as needed investments in next generation fighter aircraft, submarines, and modernized tactical vehicles. I'm also pleased that the bill focuses on combating the illicit flow of opioids and fentanyl into the country, 
which are killing countless Americans on a daily basis. The legislation takes needed steps to ensure that the DOD is focused on its core mission of being the most lethal and effective fighting force on the planet, not on advancing a woke agenda. Lastly, I'm pleased that the bill includes important defense priorities in the state of Oklahoma, including funding to accelerate the E-7, which will be based at Tinker Air Force Base. Your time I is expired. I thank the chair and my colleagues, and I yield back. The uh, gentleman reserves, the gentlewoman from California, or gentlewoman from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am going to yield two and a half minutes to the gentlewoman from California, Ms. Jacobs, who's on the Foreign Affairs Committee. And as um, many military leaders have told us, um, diplomacy, defense, and development go together. The more uh, we don't spend in, in those uh, venues, the more bullets we have to buy. So I'm pleased to have her here, as well as being a very important member of the Armed Services Committee. Mr. The Jesus. gentlewoman is recognized. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chair, I rise today in a unique position to oppose this bill especially Section 8146. I'm proud to represent San Diego, the largest military community in the country. I'm also proud to serve as one of the youngest members of this body and the youngest woman on the House Armed Services Committee. So I'm in a unique position to understand the importance of access to reproductive health care, including abortion and fertility care for our service members and their dependents. Because as a young woman, reproductive care is my health care. And that's the case for the 1.62 million women of reproductive age in the military health system too. Not to mention our LGBTQ plus service members who already have difficulty accessing necessary care. This care is essential to our health, well-being, freedom, economic security and empowerment, and for our national security too. That's why I'm thankful for DOD's policy that covers the travel and transportation costs for abortion and fertility care, a policy that is consistent with the law. This is so important now that nearly half of all service women are stationed in states with abortion restrictions because our service members have little say in where they're stationed. They can't freely take days off work and many can't afford to travel thousands of miles and pay out of pocket to receive the care they need and deserve. DOD's policy took important steps to address those barriers and make our military more accessible and inclusive. That's why I will proudly fight for our service members who have fought so much for all of us here today the least we can do is ensure they have their necessary health care. For this reason, at the appropriate time, I will offer a motion to recommit this bill back to committee. If the House rules permitted, I would have offered the motion with an important amendment to this bill. My amendment would strike section 8146. At the end of the debate, I will insert into the record the text of this amendment. I hope my colleagues will join me in voting for the motion to recommit. Before I yield, I also want to mention that while I am opposed to this bill in general, I am very proud of a bipartisan amendment that we were able to get into on block package one that would set aside $5 million in additional funding to recruit and retain direct care staff in CDCs. I've heard time and again that staffing shortages are the main driver of our military child care crisis. And in my community that has sacrificed and served so much for us, Recently, more than 4,000 military children were waiting for child care spots at San Diego's military child care centers. No. So this amendment will help support military families to access the care they need so they can focus on the mission instead of wondering if their kids expired. are safe and taken care of. I yield back. The gentleman reser uh, gentlewoman reserves. The gentleman from California is recognized. I yield to the gentleman from California, member of the Appropriations Committee, Mr. Garcia, a champion for our members in the military for two minutes. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to uh, thank the, uh, the chairman, uh, Mr. Ken Calvert, for this historic bill. I rise today in support of this uh, very conservative DOD appropriations package. I want to remind the American people that the purpose of the military is twofold. The first is to deter a war if diplomacy fails, uh, to augment diplomacy in that deterrence. And the second is if by the exhaustion of all means, we have to go to war, to actually give the American people the tools to win the war and keep our securities. That's it, to deter a war and win a war. This bill does exactly that. It trims the fat, it removes the excess uh, programs, the woke CRT programs with, within the current uh, policies under this administration, but it also critically funds our nation's most essential programs like the F-35, the Columbia-class submarine, 
the B-21 Raider, which, which I'm proud is, is made in my beautiful district, uh, California's 27th Congressional District. Uh, it moves Mexico from uh, a, a command that, that it's kind of an orphan right now by itself. Uh, and, and during this, this, this open border policy, we are now removing uh, Mexico and putting it back into SOUTHCOM so that the uh, combatant commanders can treat Mexico uh, as, as the threat that it is to our southern border and the influx of immigrants. That's very important. But with all those things, as important as they are, the weapon systems, uh, the, the change of Mexico to SOUTHCOM, the single biggest thing that we are, are taking care of, the single biggest asset within our military that we are taking care of is our troops. And I stood at this podium about six months ago and I said I would not support a Defense Department spending bill or an NDAA that did not adequately address the pay issues, especially that our junior enlisted uh, have uh, right now. About a third of our junior enlisted live below the poverty line. About a third of our enlisted qualify for food stamps right now. And I'm very proud that, that our Appropriations Committee on Defense was able to reconcile and, and address this adequately. The starting pay of a, a junior enlisted E1 was $22,000 a year, Gentlemen, and we moved that to 31000 30 seconds. The starting Gentlemen's salary of, a, of an E1 in the military right now is $22,000 a year. That is the equivalent of $11 an hour. This bill takes that to $31,200, gets some parity with their civilian counterparts, and addresses this, the record high uh, civilian pay gap that our junior enlisted. I urge support of the DOD appropriations package uh, and a yes vote on the bill. Thank you. The gentleman reserves, the gentlewoman from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, everyone is welcome to serve in an all volunteer army. We need everyone to feel that they are welcome to serve in our all volunteer army. And that sometimes means doing a little extra outreach. I had to do that with my military academies uh, to let all the students know that this was a great opportunity for them to get a great education and serve our country. It was outreach. It was inclusion. It reached out to diversity. And it's made our military academies stronger for that. So the bottom line for me is if you're willing to take the oath of office, if you're willing to put your life on the line for our country and you can get through boot camp and you want to serve our country, you're welcome to serve. Mr. Chair, I'd like to yield three minutes from the gentleman from Hawaii, a fabulous member of the Defense Subcommittee, Mr. Case, who is invaluable in helping us understand our challenges in the Indo-Pacific. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to my friend from Minnesota. I rise in opposition to this measure. And I must say to my friend and colleague and chair of the, the subcommittee and to my majority colleagues that it's deeply frustrating and deeply regretful to have to stand in opposition to a bill that in so many ways is a very, very good bill. Uh, my colleague, Mr. Garcia, reflected in his comments just now many provisions of the bill with which I can agree. Uh, this bill does great things for the Indo-Pacific. It's eyes wide open on the threat of China. It funds the Pacific Deterrence Initiative. It provides uh, for strengthening of allies and partners' relationships. It helps our service members. There's so much good in this bill. And so what is so frustrating is to see it infected with the same kind of partisan provisions um, and divisive issues that for a long time have not been a part of the Appropriations Subcommittee on Defense. This has been a, a refuge of sorts from the, from the culture wars, from, from the division that we've seen. Uh, elsewhere and now no longer is. And this is the consequence. The consequence um, is division in the Department of Defense and in our re relations and, and review of the Department of Defense, which should not be infected by these areas for, an, for, a, for a department that is, um, again, very realistic about the threats we face. My colleagues have talked about a lot of these issues already that create a fatal, uh, fatal flaws in this bill, but I'm going to focus on one, and that is climate change. Oh, no. Let's not say those words, climate change. Somehow we are all supposed to react to this as if it's some kind of uh, thing that we can put up on the shelf. Well, the Department of Defense does not ignore climate change. The Department of Defense has had its own eyes wide open for decades now on the risks of climate change. We can go back, for example, to January 2019, which is one of its most recent reports. And this is a report from the DOD, report on the effects of a changing climate. Is that a better way to say it? Uh, to the Department of Defense, and I quote from the executive summary, the effects of a changing climate are a national security issue with potential impacts to the Department of Defense, 
missions, operational plans, and installations. Our 2018 National Defense Strategy prioritizes long-term strategic competition with great power competitors. To achieve these goals, DOD must be able to adapt current and future operations to address the impacts of a variety of threats and conditions, including those from weather and natural events. To that end, DOD factors in the effects of the environment into its mission planning and execution to build resilience. Pretty realistic on the part of the DOD. Followed up by very definite um, reports uh, here, the Department of Defense Climate Adaptation Plan from September 1, 2021. Climate Adaptation Plan 22 Progress Report, Climate Risk Analysis, um, October 2021. DOD is not ignoring this issue, however you want to label it, nor can it. Shall we ignore uh, the rise in, in sea level at Pearl Harbor, where we're investing billions and billions of dollars? Shall we Gentlemen, ignore time's expired. Uh, the consequences to Guam of hurricanes? Of course we need to do this. So let's get away from this approach of defunding uh, climate risk analysis in the DOD. Thank you. Gentlewoman reserves, the gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, thank the chair. Uh, to my friend, we fund resilience uh, in this bill. What we don't fund is electrifying Bradleys and tanks, uh, which makes no sense. With that, I reserve the balance of my time. The uh, gentleman reserves, the gentlewoman from Minnesota is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm prepared to close as we have no further speakers. Um, I want to say again how sad I am to be disappointed uh, to see these divisive writers um, in, in the bill. And they're all to gratify the extreme right of a few people in the Republican Party. I also don't make a habit of complimenting the Senate. But we should take note that their appropriators are operating in a bipartisan fashion. Their defense bill was passed out of committee 27 to 1 because it had no divisive language and it made cooperation possible. Go back and watch our markup of this defense bill. And you just have to ask yourself, are we doing our job as appropriators? We're not discussing our increasingly broken military health care system, which I've heard from military family and service members both here at home and when I've traveled abroad on bases, the lack of support for mental health, the lack of uh, access, uh, even here in the United States, uh, to immediate health care concerns for themselves and their family members. And as I pointed out, we are solely uh, now facing lack of obstetrics and gynecology on our military bases right here in the United States, making the travel that the Department of Defense put in for, uh, for uh, women service members and women family members to get their full health care needs. We could be talking about the merits of supporting Ukraine and how the democracies are coming together to show communism and terrorism that we stand united in our goals and principles. Or we could be talking about how to jumpstart shipbuilding to compete with what China is already doing in the Indo-Pacific. But we spent our markup arguing about extreme social policies that have no place in this bill. And now we're running out of time with the shutdown fast approaching. Our service members and their families have made a, a, a tremendous, a considerable sacrifice to serve our nation. So the least we can do is give them a government that stays open and pays them on time. Now I know Chairwoman Granger and Chairman Calvert and I believe that uh, we can get this job done. But the majority must show that it can govern in a bipartisan fashion and work with us to get these bills done. And that's what we've done plenty of times and what I'm hopeful we will do in the future. But for right now, I have to ask my colleagues to oppose this bill. And let's get the appropriations process back on a bipartisan track. And with that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. The gentlewoman yields back. The gentleman from California is recognized. Uh, I thank the gentlelady and for her comments. And uh, I know that eventually we'll work out our differences. But um, yes, I admit 
This bill prohibits funding for Drag Queen Story Hour for kids and drag queens in recruitment. I had to choose between building ships or that, those kinds of decisions. I, I chose the ships. But with that, uh, this debate will go on forward. I want to talk about the readiness of our military operations, building the necessary equipment to make sure that our men and women uh, win any war that we may have to uh, involve ourselves in, hopefully none. And with that, I yield back the balance of my time.